Hey yo, Brent went to Dada, calls went to text Planes turned to drones, robotics in effect Everybody using apps just to place a few bets With Media 2.0, what's coming next? Well, Sarah Wise, thanks very much for coming on New Media 2.0. Uh, I thought best place to start would be maybe as your role as head of the AFL Media Network. Now, there'll be many people here fully aware of just how big the AFL's media team is, but there's many that will be completely unaware that the AFL even has a media wing. So maybe if you could start by just walking us through just how big the AFL Media Network is and, and what your role entails. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, so the AFL digital department is um, is pretty big and sprawling. The AFL media network specifically inside it has um, a team of about 80 content creators, everything from our news and journalists right through to social media, to videographers, animation, um, motions, graphics, um, podcasters. So um, our role really is to create content um, for fan engagement, and then to be able to distribute all that content on our on our series of webs websites and apps, um, which we we should probably reach about five to six million fans every month. Um, so it's pretty significant. It's, it's interesting that you kind of start there because I think that there aren't many people who really know that we even have a media arm actually, and it's significantly bigger um, than other sporting codes media business, and it's the probably I think it's the biggest um, digital sports publishing network in Australia. Um, so it's, it's actually huge. It's been going since 2012 um, and has grown significantly over those years. And we can see you sitting at, at home in what looks like your lounge room or your office. Uh, we're all working through incredible times. What's it been like managing a team through this COVID period with a, a sporting body that's just had to be so adaptable? It's, it's been very difficult. Um, and I think as, as an industry that's been probably one of the hardest hit because of COVID, if you think about, you know, travel, aviation, sport, um, it's, it's been pretty tough. Um, we've all been working. We worked for, from home for about 10 or 11 months, all of us. Um, we went back to the office on the 1st of February for just two or three days a week. Um, two days, not three days. Um, and then more recently, we're back in, obviously, we're on the back of the lockdown, back at home again. So, it has been quite difficult. I think um, we've had a lot of learnings and there's been a ton of opportunity as a result. Um, and we've really had to learn, you know, entirely new ways to communicate, to get things done and, you know, and also to be able to retain the culture that we've had in the team. So um, it's, it's been difficult, no doubt, but um, I feel like we're better for it, though. What do you feel some of those big learnings have been? Um, you, you sort of take for granted, I think, just how... We all, um, I guess, work every day. The incidental conversations in the hallway while you're making a cup of tea. Um, the, be able, the, the fact you can go and grab 10 people quickly to get, jump in a room for a quick meeting if you need them. Like, it just requires more thought and more planning. And so we've, we've introduced different tools and stuff, you know, chat and, you know, um, different services that we can try and stay more connected. But you just have to be more planned and more thoughtful, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because you don't always need to have meetings is what we've learned in, the, in this time but it's um it's been a, yeah different different ways of working entirely do you feel like young employees uh get hurt more in in the new structure i would have thought that the more senior more competent em employees probably don't require those incidental conversations as much because they already know what they're doing but i would have thought you know really junior employees that are introduced to a new workforce do you have to set up more stru more structured areas for them to be able to ask what what's deemed a a stupid question, if you like. Yeah, it's a good point. There's been, there's been a lot of narrative, I think, around this. I've got a bit of a different view, which is, I think when when I was kind of starting out in my career, I think you're right, that, that, you know, generationally, that's how we all learn. You sort of learn, you learn from your bosses and people who are more senior than you. And there's, there's kind of more analog ways of learning, if you like. But if you think about a young person now joining any business, there's the cultural piece that you get from being connected with other people and more experienced people. But I just don't think younger people learn the same way that we learn, or we learned back in the day, not that we're that old. But, um, but no, I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. There's a lot of business leaders right now who are talking about the disservice we have to young people. I, I just disagree. I just think that younger people communicate and learn in completely different ways. And I don't know if that needs to be in person or in this kind of more analog, I teach you something, you watch, you learn, when you have the internet. <laughs> you know, I think there's much more... Um, easier, more accessible ways of getting information than just being in the office. So I have a, 
a different view, which is, has been controversial based on a recent conversation, where I think I was the only one who thought that. So maybe don't worry. And what about the accessibility to players and, and coaches throughout this time? You, you mentioned sort of young people, but the ability to see players being interviewed, uh, you know, off nothing more than their iPhone on, on Fox footy or on, on Channel 7 is something very different to what we saw even a few years ago, where if a player was doing a live stream, they'd have a, a TV camera crew at their house and cameramen and, and, and sound men or women, you know, that feels like it's, it's changed rapidly and we're not going to go back to the old, old ways. What have been some of the things you've felt in your media network that's been a positive throughout this period? I think expectation has just changed like entirely. I think during that COVID period when fans recognised they weren't going to be able to get that necessarily high quality or, or what probably more accurately broadcasters and media networks thought the quality should be for mm. fans uh, versus actually what works. And like we've actually kept some of the styles of production that have come out of COVID in just how we work every day. There's, there's something about a journalist interviewing a coach on Zoom, which makes it feel really personal, far more personal than if you're in a bit more of a kind of stage setup. So we've actually kept some of those different styles of production, um, depending on what it is that we're doing. Um, but I just think it's the expectation. I think we all think everything has to be really perfect and really high end. And what we've learned is that the access and the behind the scenes nature of what you can get sometimes when you're filming on your phone is actually what resonates better with fans. So we've actually learned a lot and it's cost us a few quid actually as well by doing so. Well, I think, I think um, yeah, people giving interviews are pretty are much more relaxed if it is just them and their phone and the yeah. interviewer down the other end and being surrounded, you know, half a metre away by, by three people in their, in their personal space. Are there some things that fans won't, uh, you know, won't, won't uh, settle for like a sound quality an issue or if something's catching or what are some of the things that you feel are non-negotiable? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I reckon we're still figuring that out if, we're, if I'm honest. I think there's, it's less about what fans won't tolerate. I think it's more around meeting the fan where they're at. So if I'm subscribing to KO and I'm watching a game, there's a certain expectation around a paid subscription service and around, you know, the, the production techniques and, um, you know, some of the high quality end of town that I'm expecting as, as a consumer. But if I'm on social media, my expectation around that based on my, the fact that I'm scrolling on my phone is, is wildly different. Mm. I think what we have to accept is that there's going to be different types of content with different types of production, depending on where the fan is at at that particular moment in time. So I think it's around marrying that native experience, actually, as, rather than saying everything needs to be of a certain quality across the board. And what do you feel like the importance is of the AFL having its own media channels as opposed to just leaning on, you know, Foxtel and, and Channel 7 and the other media partners? I think this, um, this is, you know, this is always a point of contention a little bit. Um, AFL media gets a lot of talk amongst sports media um, because it's really big and it's been really successful. And it was, it was pretty insightful, I think, and progressive for the AFL to, to start and invest in its own media business back in 2012. But I think if you, if you think about the relationship any brand needs to have with its fan or consumer or customer, it has to be direct. Like the, the future of um, any business is direct to consumer. Like it has to be. Um, whether that is, whether you're Amazon and you're a retail business and you're trying to sell products directly to your, to your customers um, or right through to you know, the sporting league. We, 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 I think for the AFL specifically, we kind of sometimes look like we're competing with broadcast partners, but we're actually not. We're, AFL is almost invested in the value of its game and live rights and media rights by having its own internal media arm. So I think we're kind of viewed in different ways, but I, th I think it's hugely important for any brand to have a direct-to-fan or direct-to-consumer offering, whether that is on-demand content, whether that's live content, whether that's social content, um, because that, that's the future of all media and, and all brands, really. How do you manage that, that perception of conflicts where you've got AFL media reporting on AFL issues? Um, you know, there, there, there's a, there is a difference between, um, you know, Amazon having a social media account and Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post and giving Amazon favourable uh, news. How do, you, how, do you, how do you marry that potential conflict or perceived conflict out there between AFL running their own media network? 
Yeah, it's um. So when it started, this is before my time. So in 2012, when it started, the way that I think the team and it was mostly a news team. So A4 Media started as a news business. It was a digital news business. Um, and the way they got around it was almost overcompensating so much they went the other way. Like we're hard on the AFL, was it? Oh my it? god, they were yeah, they yeah, so okay. hard on the AFL. So they and it was actually run by um, a bunch of really credible journalists who felt that this should be an independent media organization. And to be independent, we've got to be brutal sometimes. We've got to tell the truth. And I think that it worked really well, actually. It was exactly what they needed to do at the time because it built a, a real loyal fan base and um, an audience where fans didn't feel like it was a propaganda machine. Yeah. yeah. But it wasn't some sort of PR engine. But I think what's happened over time is um, there, there is no such thing as an independent news business, unfortunately. <laughs> there, there isn't. There's every, every single news business has um, an agenda of some kind. So we certainly don't... Um, our editorial guidelines are not around trying to favour in any way. It's always to try and have that really authentic, credible voice. But we, we can't forget we are the official voice of the AFL. Um, but, but you can't be the PR machine because you'll just lose all your fans. I look forward to pointing out to Damien Barrett that AFL media used to be full of full of credible journalists, is what you just said, and, and now is just full of light and fluffy journalists. So I'll, I'll be looking forward to mentioning that to Damien when I speak to you next. But, um, yeah, I think that's right. And I think, too, like it's not... It's a sport. Like it's a fun sport. Sometimes people talk about conflicts in AFL, and you're like, "Yeah, I mean, there's conflicts everywhere." But let's not forget, it's a sport. It's not life and death. Um, oh, I, I like- totally agree. Like ha- having this is my first job in sport, and my perception of working in sport before I joined is a bit different, actually, from when you're working in it. It's actually yeah. quite, and, you, and you'd know this from your from your time. But um, I, I think there's definitely more fun to be had. And if you and Look, I know you're kind of joking around Damien Barrett. I hope you're joking. Um, <laughs> no, I am actually genuinely looking forward to pointing it out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but look, what we've done is like, if you think about, you know, I've been in the business for two and a half years. And when I got there, we, we were kind of in this point of, we built a really great following and a really great audience to this news product. But it feels like we need to kind of do like a bit of an AFL media 2.0. And like, what does that need to look like? And so mm. part of that was around reducing, um, you know, we still have a lot of news and a lot of journalists, but like we, we, we've reduced that content output and we've gone much harder into video storytelling documentaries. We've done something mm. recently this year that you would have seen with Amazon making their mark. Mm. That was kind of a really big project that's kind of come to fruition this year. We've launched AFL On Demand, so our own video service that will be in Connected TV later on this year. Um, we've gone hard into social. We've got as many social audience followers now um, as we do on our owned and operated app and website. Um, so we've gone harder into other areas. So trying to be a bit more accessible to all fans, not necessarily the hardcore avid fan who just wants to be critical or look at the stats. It's much more around, you know, families and women and kids and youth and casual fans who we never really catered for. So um, not that we don't do news, but I think news is commoditized. That was our, that was our, that was the kind of big aha moment, I think, for the AFL. It was, you know, we still have to cover the game and give fans what they want and still be able to, you know, to provide that um, element of correctness when there might be a broader narrative that might be going elsewhere. But really our job is to grow the game and to engage fans. And so that, that, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that's just news. You know, that, that's much more entertainment content, actually, not necessarily information content. And what has some of the research shown as to, to what today's fans want from, from the AFL and the way they consume the product? Well, we kind of had a, a real um, moment during COVID actually around this. It's f- fans want to be, they want to be behind the curtain. Yeah. That's, that's what they want more than anything. They want to feel in the know, but they, they want to get up close and personal to the players, to the stars, to the coaches. Well, our best performing video maybe ever on the network was um, a, a kind of short kind of episodic series that we did uh, called Sound the Alarm where we mic'd up the coaches from the grand final from the previous year. And then we created kind of four mini episodes and then kind of mash it together for one, like, you know, 25 minute episode. Um, fans absolutely loved it. Like I couldn't believe the results. And we had a bit of a bet internally. A lot of, a lot of the sport fans, a lot of the football fans, like this, this will be the best thing for the network. And I was like, no way, absolutely no way. Like this is low grade. It's not even produced. It's just a fixed camera in the coach's box with the coach mic'd up and then we're just we're just splitting 
their commentary um, with what you're seeing on field and then matching that commentary to the other coach. Have you got some censoring beats on it? <laughs> Major censoring. <laughs> but so it wasn't even the quarter time address or anything like that. It was just nope. the, nope. wow. Just the coach's response to what they were seeing on field. And it went off the charts. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot of, I mean, even the Amazon making their mark documentary yeah. series, the, it's the access. Like, it sounds so simple. But I don't think the AFL has really had or even allowed that level of access ever before. So fans would never have seen that. Um, so they, they just want to be up close and personal. They want to be behind the scenes. They don't want the sanitised version. They don't want the rehearsal. And, and I think the, the style of production that we talked about earlier, just around the Zoom calls, the phone calls, filming on your phone, that all lends itself to this, you know, no one else has seen this but you. And this is really personal. It's very one-on-one. -on -one. And that, that's what's worked best for us. Do you think too, like in an era where players feel uh, pretty robotic and they almost have to be by nature due to the level of scrutiny they're under and, um, you know, from a really young age, they get trained to say almost nothing whenever they get interviewed. Do you think, uh, and they look, they look like professional athletes. You don't have overweight guys playing football anymore or school teachers or plumbers or it's harder for the average fan, it can be, to relate because they don't see themselves in the players as much as they did a couple of generations ago where the players were school teachers and plumbers and, and X, Y, Z. Do you think shows like Making Their Mark can sort of transition the players to make them relatable again because you can see them uncut and raw in, in ways that we haven't been able to for a while? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think it's around showing the human behind the player you know it's everyone's human you know mm. and I think that I think that show because we because we had filmed that during COVID there was there was a, a ton of insight you know whether that was Eddie Betts really missing his family and just feeling really down about that and missing his kids you know that, that any mum or dad can relate to that mm. you know, that, that's, that's not because he's a football player that's because he's a parent and so I think showing the human side behind players I think is um makes fans more empathetic. I think you're still going to have that media scrutiny, unfortunately. I think that's just one of those, um, you know, things that come with the job, I suppose, unfortunately. And we're doing a lot of work in, in the social space around protecting our players and everyone mm -hmm. in our industry around that kind of, you know, hate, hateful comment, uh, you know, and comments, for example. But it is it is difficult. But, but on the point around the players and the media training, like right, some of the best stuff we've seen has really come from our female players actually in the last couple of years because they haven't had that media training necessarily. They're not they're not media trained within the inch of their lives, um, and they I think they're much bigger users of social media in general. So they always to me they just come across as far more authentic and relaxed because they don't necessarily have the same spotlight and same pressure as some of the male players. So I think it's quite interesting, but I think it's a shame because the fans kind of want more of that. They, they don't want the Okay, what should you say at a press conference? They just want to know, they want to get to know you as a player, as a person, as opposed to what you think you should be saying about your performance just now. Mm. And what about in, in terms of fan desire for media coverage, not just uh, interviews and access to players, could you see a world where there's more bespoke offerings for, for, for games where fans can pick which camera view, angles they want, things like that? Can you, can you see that happening in the future? Yeah, I, th I think it has to. It kind of goes under our kind of, you know, one of our kind of core pillars for the next few years is really around personalisation and being mm. able to um, have a unique view and aspect of the game, whether that is live content, whether that's on-demand content. But I think this, no this notion of multi-stream production, so I want to watch the game from this angle and I want to be able to, and now I want to flick back to this angle. I think that kind of really lends itself well to mobile viewing, I think people that that feels like a, a natural extension of how people would, would consume content on their mobile. But I think it's um it's a huge opportunity, and the personalization piece is, I mean, outside of fans wanting that, we have to do that anyway. We've almost got too much content, not enough real estate. Mm. So if you if you go on the app, if you go on the AFL app, and you're looking for anything, it will take you hours to get through all of the day's content. Now, not all of that content is relevant to me, but I need to be showing what content is relevant to me. And I think that's really around, you know, creating a set of preferences, but then using AI to be able to recommend the right things to you. But the, um, but the multi-stream production, I think, is a huge opportunity. Um, I think we'll start to see at match in stadium, maybe first, before we see it in a broadcast environment. And in terms of that personalisation, could you see a world where 
rather than having one commentary team, be it via Channel 7 or Fox to each game, you might have five or six smaller commentary teams targeting niche audiences, be it, you know, younger demographics, older demographics, um, you know, women, people that want to have a laugh during the game. Could you ever see a world where that exists to create more targeted opportunities for sponsors? Yeah, I, I, I definitely do. And there's some stuff that we're playing around with at the moment. One, one of the challenges in the audio space is around latency. Um, it's around how do you match up commentary to the exact split second of the game. So if, you, if you're wanting to listen to that, let's say you and I did, we, we formed a commentary team. Yeah. And it was a bit comical. We were having a bit of a laugh around it and it wasn't that serious. And you wanted to listen to that live in real time um, over the actual live game. We'd have to be able to match that up perfectly. So there's quite a lot of work in that space around latency and making sure the commentary does. But, it, but in terms of what fans are wanting, there's opportunity, I think, for fans to be able to get together and create their own commentary teams. But also yeah. other media outlets that aren't necessarily sporting outlets. You know, that might, it could be Mamma Mia who wants to do a commentary mm -hmm. of a game, or it could be, you know, other sport. The, 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 big, the big thing in all of that is around the rights. Like, how do you kind of make sure that when we're doing audio rights deals, it kind of allows for more commentary teams to come in, whether it's fun or serious or sponsor-led or otherwise. But I think it's a, it comes back to that personal relation. You can't just have one, two, three commentary teams because you're only ever appealed to the same audience segment. If we want to grow the game, you have to have different ways of bringing the game to, to different fans. And that seems to be such a challenge for, for a Channel 7 is you do have to appeal to everyone, don't you? Whereas you look at the radio rights, for instance, you know, each, each radio that, that covers AFL feels like they've got quite a specific audience they're trying to appeal to, so they can real, really double down on that. It's probably easier for advertisers to work out which radio station they want to attract to, depending on yep. which demographic they need. Uh, but it also must be a challenge around control too. I guess if you open up too many commentary teams, the AFL's got a really strong brand proposition they want to protect. Um, I guess that must be a consideration that comes into it as well. Yeah, it, it definitely is. But I think it, it, it is. But the other, the other, there's a kind of part of me that thinks, how much can you really control it? Like, what's really stopping anyone now from doing it? Mm. Like, I could, you know, if I had a strong social media presence or if I was an influencer, if I had a strong following um, and I decided to just commentate on games, well, there's, not, there's nothing really stopping me. And this has always been the push-pull. Like, we have a lot of this in, in the content team. Like, we have a lot of younger fans who are basically taking live footage and making funny videos right yeah so they're not allowed to do that beyond a certain point there's a, there's a rights breach but there's the kind of an argument to say well if you're trying to reach a younger fan base and that's kind of what that younger fan base wants why wouldn't you embrace that and give those people more footage <laughs> It's free advertising for the AFL, isn't it? Well, that's right. And, that, that, and that's why the broader constructs of rights is a really interesting one when you think about that democratisation of content. Because if you're really, truly trying to reach a 12-year-old fan, what does anyone in our team know about reaching a 12-year-old fan, frankly? Mm. Like, you need to be able to have an army of 12-year-old kids <laughs> creating content for their audience set. And I think that, that, that's, the, that's the kind of, I think, the complexity of all of this is, it's, it's a really good word, actually, control. Like you're sort of relinquishing control at that point. Um, I and mean, we have done some work with a couple of, um, I guess, influencers or creators, content creators in the YouTube space, where we've actually got them in. So rather than sort of tell them off, you, know, you shouldn't have used that content or what you're doing using that, we're actually kind of going, okay, well, why don't you come? You've obviously got something about you that's attracting a really large audience set of your demographic. Why don't you come in and actually help us create content? For that particular audience set and it's worked quite well so we've had a few trials like that where and even, actually a couple of brands even got behind it a couple of sponsors are like you know and a lot of corporates they don't, they don't know about mm. this audience. they know they're really important but they don't, they don't know because it is you know that you don't have any 12 years working in your marketing team or your mm -hmm. content team and rightly so because that's child labor but it's <laughs> um but it's how, how rather than kind of yeah telling them off how do you bring them in and get them get them helping to contribute to different types of content that we would otherwise wouldn't know how to make. And that younger audience feels like the one is the one that's slipping away from the AFL at the minute. That's sort of the view by many, and I think the numbers support it, that a lot of that, particularly the teen years, they're 
being more and more attracted to, to esports and video gaming and, and having different interests. Um, what have been your learnings from some, say something like Twitch, which is just wildly popular, which for those that don't know is Amazon owned uh, video streaming service where professional gamers will often, um, you know, show content of themselves playing video games, but the hours watched on that by that, that younger generation are just mind blowing and the fan engagement's huge. What if any have been some of your learnings from, from the phenomena that is Twitch? Yeah, I think it's um, it unbelievable platform for a particular audience, different types of consumption again. And I think it's they, they, what they've done really well is tap into the way fans are using that platform. So it's about creating a native experience to that platform, not trying to repurpose content from a different channel into Twitch. I think um, gaming and esports generally is such a huge opportunity. And we have had a couple of trials at the AFL in the last few years. Not, not that they've gone particularly well. They've been really good tests and learns. But it's, um, I think it's an area that directionally we know we need to be involved in. It's working out what the execution might be, whether that is creating some kind of team that competes in, in some kind of online game. We did something um, a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was around Le League of Legends, I think it was, where we were kind of helping out from the actual physical event side of things. Um, again, good, good directionally. Not sure if that was quite the right execution. But for us, it's about trying to have as much, and you mentioned about, you know, younger audiences and it might be slipping away from us. I think every brand is having that same yeah. time. Unless you're a brand that's been created in the last sort of 10 years who have nailed that younger audience. Every other brand will be trying to work out how do we remain relevant. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's our job at the AFL. Our job is to, our job isn't to compete with our broadcast partners or other media. Our job is to continually invest in making the game relevant so we have a really brilliant participation program in Auskick, for example, but not necessarily a digital product that supports Auskick. And if we know all those kids are online on YouTube or Netflix mm -hmm. or ABC Kids or wherever they're watching, where, where is the AFL's role in that digital experience to the, to the actual program? But from, a, from a, an eSports perspective, it, again, we're not competing with that. The, the, more, the more we can have presence of whether it's AFL players or AFL conversations or AFL fans, um, the better for us. It's kind of our investment into all of those spaces. But I don't think we've cracked it. We've had the AFL Gamers Network that was launched during COVID. We had a lot of players who weren't able to play um, football because of the lockdown, um, turning to their passion of um, esports and gaming. And we saw some unbelievable numbers, but, the, but the, it's a different type of fan engagement. Mm. And again, it's, it's these different behaviors that I think we all have to learn if you're going to be in the business of content creation for those young audiences. I've got quite a few mates now that are obsessed with um, these astronomical in-game multis. So they're never going to win them. It's a pretty reasonably small outlay. There's the most ridiculous number of variables. And it, watching them, it almost feels like it's replaced the lotto ticket, you know. It, I mean, it's a, it's a type of fan engagement. Yeah. Are you seeing a rise of popular, popularity in, in those... Um, those in-game multis and some of the different betting products available? And can you see that being a, a positive thing? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think gambling is, it was always met with kind of like two schools of thought. I think in any mm. sport, it's, it's, it's culturally part of the way people fan for mm. some audiences. Like some audience segments or some fan bases, part of the way that they fan is having a punch. That's kind of what, that's kind of part of their experience. But there's other fans, um, if you're a parent of a child who is interested in a game, or if you're, if you're a kid, you don't want to be showing those types of fan engagements or advertising. Yeah. To, and it's, it's always a really difficult one for the AFL, I think, to balance. It's um, how do you balance the way fans want to and expect to be able to fan with the corporate sponsorship opportunity that helps us fund the game with responsible gambling and doing the right thing ethically and from a community point of view, it's always quite difficult. And I, and I think, you know, I don't know if this is talking out of school or not, but gambling is not illegal. No. And so I think until it's illegal, it's kind of difficult because then it becomes more of an ethical decision. And if you look at the fan bases, they'll tell you different things. Some are really offended by it, don't ever want to see it. Mm. You know, we'll, we'll, get, um, we'll get complaints from some of our fans saying, you know, there's too much gambling advertising. But then other fans, it's kind of part of their weekend experience. So it's really difficult. And so what, what we try to do is um, 
is to try to have a sensible balance. We're obviously, you know, big on rules and being quite conservative anyway, but we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we'll follow those. But we'll also have a creative execution of some of those um, advertisements and, and product um, integrations that I think are not, try, not trying to be so overt or in your face. So how we've managed, for example, with personalization, like I can sign up, I can, I can have an option in the AFL app to turn off gambling odds if I want to. Mm. So we're kind of now giving choice to fans, which is that kind of personalization piece that we talked about. It's, you know, if I don't want to see that, I can turn that off. And soon we'll be able to have age gating because we'll have single sign on. You'll be able to log into the app and based on your age profile, you might, you won't be shown certain advertisements. So we shouldn't have, you know, mums or dads saying my 13 year old was exposed to gambling ads because we would be able to turn that off if we knew who that person was who was viewing that content. And so until we have that bit, and that's that, that's that big piece around identity or single sign on, until we have that, it's very difficult to target or target away certain ads or messages um, based on different age profiles. But we will have that in the future. And more broadly, do you think people are stronger from prohibition or by learning that individual responsibility? That's a good question. I, I think um, I think that the AFL has a job to do. It's, 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 it has a responsibility and a job to do around um, the messages that it, it sends to fans. Like it, it, it has um, everything from you know us having commentary in the news right through to the advertising dollars that we take. Um, you know, and I think now more than ever, um, businesses and fans and customers and consumers are very interested in the purpose. Um, and what brands stand for. So I think we'll always we'll always play a role in being able to kind of safe gate that or curate what kind of messages and experiences there are. But that that's that kind of that's that kind of bridging those two worlds. You, but you also can't patronise. People need to have their own choice. They need to make up their own mind. And so we just try to try and play those both sides and try to do the right thing. So it's a balancing act between the AFL saying this is what we stand for without overstepping the mark and saying this is what you stand for. Is that sort of the balancing act the AFL tries to get right? Because I find nothing more annoying than having an alternate group tell me how to think about things which are usually much more complex than how they're portrayed in, in small media bites. Yeah, I mean, look, we try to do that. Whether we always get that right, I don't know. Um, but that, that's absolutely what we try to do. We, we try to have balanced conversations and try to make balanced decisions um, around that but I know that you know you'll always be met with some criticism and some people who think you've, you've done the wrong thing I think that's kind of part and parcel absolutely well that uh it feels a pretty good place as any to uh to finish before we uh we offend either the civil libertarians or the the people against gambling <laughs> or uh, I was hoping to get one more swipe in at Damien Barrett before he ended but uh <laughs> The one, cheap shop felt like, the one cheap shop felt like enough. But uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Really appreciate it. I know you've got plenty on, so thanks for coming on for a chat. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. If you're enjoying New Media 2.0, please subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.